Uh, hello, everybody. everyone, and welcome to episode nine of the Naked Wine podcast. I can't believe it's already the ninth episode. Time flies when you're having fun and drinking fun. Drinking and uh, Remington's here, of course, and we have a very, very special guest today, Benjamin Lynn. Hi, Ben. You can call me Ben. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so stoked to have Ben on today. Episode nine. Ben is a young winemaker architect by day, winemaker by day and night. But Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself. So happy to be here. Winemaker never friend. sleeps, Trimmington. <laughs> um, sure. So yeah, um, a little while ago, I had the privilege we were just talking about. I took Remington out um, sailing with one of our friends out on Lake Washington. I'm in Seattle, by the way, for all of our uh, California listeners. Um, <laughs> um, and, and then I turned 39 for the second annual birthday. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. um, <laughs> Love it. And I uh, decided to rope a bunch of friends into going sailing off the coast of Croatia. Um, That's how you do it. it. Yeah. And and I should, I should back up for a second before we get to Croatia. Um, I had been um, kind of like, I think you guys were, you like had joined a, a natural wine club and were just learning more, more and more about all the delicious juice that um, from a low interventionist perspective. And, um, and I joined one too with, with, uh, with my housemate um, at our favorite wine bar called Lausanne, which is French for sea urchin, and it's a few huh. blocks away. Awesome. Um, great little French seafood restaurant. But we were just drinking wine, um, learning more and more. And, uh, and then the big Croatia trip happened. And I had this epiphany looking out on the Adriatic Sea from the deck of this catamaran that we'd rented. Um, and I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like staring at a computer at a desk is just not what I want to be doing anymore. <laughs> I I'm, was looking at the sun-drenched vineyard covered islands that we were motoring past or sailing past. Um, and I, I pointed there, that's what I want to do. <laughs> um, and I came home and I like, um, decided to leave my job in architecture and I got a new part-time gig and um, enrolled in school for winemaking. So, wow. yeah, that's, that's amazing. I so I'm doing you. that. I'm doing that full-time and I work in architecture part-time. I love it. Live in the and, many- <laughs> and I make wine at home also. Hmm. So did you start making wine at home first before you got into the school or vice versa? No, I was in my second quarter of class. Of course, like, um, I should probably talk a little bit about um, the program I'm in. Yeah, I'm curious to know about, I mean, that's amazing yeah. that you made that midlife, if you want to call it. I mean, it makes it none of us are that old but um to like actually follow through with it and flip that around and do school full-time and architecture full-time so tell us a little bit yeah about it the was, school it was, in the class it honestly is still pretty intimidating to do this midlife career change um but i am so stoked and passionate about wine now and i um it's all i think about yeah um Same. but i uh i enrolled at the northwest wine academy which is a part of South Seattle College, part of the community college system in Seattle. And it's a great program. There's actually two, um, two paths that you can choose. One is for wine production, and the other is like a marketing and sales track. And initially, that's what I thought I would do. I thought, um, uh, coming back from Croatia, I was like, you know what? It's so hard to get Croatian wine in the United States. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll learn how to do importing and I could, you know, <laughs> bring, bring the delicious Croatian wine to the masses. Yeah. 
Totally. Sounds like um, a great idea. Yeah, but um, but then I toured the school and I looked and I saw the tanks and the barrels and the freaking forklift and I was like, yes, that's <laughs> what I want to do. That looks like so much more fun, getting your hands dirty. Um, and it's uh, uh, an associate's degree program in wine production. Um, and there's maybe six quarters that you do in sequence for the wine production. Um, so you basically get two harvests in and you wow. get to work with the wine that you're processing. That's and so you're cool. working with uh, a teacher winemaker uh, whose name is Bill Snyder. I should give him a plug. Um, that was really great. And, and there's also other classes like wine chemistry and wine microbiology and um, really fun classes like sensory evaluation and classes about wines the world. And then they do a pretty good job about exposing you to all the business related um, aspects of running a winery, um, tasting room management, um, excise taxes, wow. um, all the things that like are pretty mundane and yeah. most makers don't usually like to do, but is a pretty important part of the business. Um, we've, we've kind of, and I assume it's similar for winemakers, you're in it because of your passion for making wine, but if you just make a shit ton of wine and you just have your friends and family to drink it, that's cool and all, but how do you make it a business? Same way with our podcast. Yeah. We love drinking and talking to people like you, but... <laughs> I don't know if I should even divulge this, but the all posting and um, the endorsing of the episode in this net, it's fun, but not nearly as fun. Yeah, um, marketing is a job. Can relate. Itself. And yeah. um, I don't know, to make it in this world, especially in the wine industry, you have to uh, be a promoter. They say that like one of the jokes is, in, is common in the wine industry is that it's really hard to make wine, but it's way harder to sell your wine. And so yeah. that's mm -hmm. something that I'm learning. Um, but to answer your question, I was two quarters in and the second quarter that I was a student at the academy, COVID happened and we were um, not going, you know, nobody was leaving the house for anything. Um, and I realized like, oh, you know, I've decided to do this major uh, career change and I've never even attempted to do the thing that I'm like learning how to do. Um, and of course we are all like, you know, sequestered in our homes. We should like use this time wisely to invest in hobbies. Totally. And so I ordered a, a winemaking kit online and I watched. Give us a, can you recommend the first kit you ordered? Yeah. Um, don't even, don't worry about it, but I'm just. You I can go to dad's. any like, any home brewing store like locally where you, where cool. you are has winemaking kits. And I would recommend getting like a six, six gallon, six gallon quantity is, is a good place to start. Now I will say, because it was like May, um, I ordered like the Provence style rosé, I'm doing air quotes there for our um, podcast friends. Um, <laughs> and it was, you know, when you order these kits online, it's not real grapes, it's like grape concentrate. So the first, um, the first batch that I made um, was amazing. Like it is so cool to mix all the ingredients together and pour the little yeast in. And then like a day and a half later, it starts happening. Like, you're, yeah. you, like you, your wine comes alive. It totally starts making the like, in a similar fashion as all of our quarantine sourdough yeah. experimenters, yeah. fermentation. Comes to light yeah. in your eyes. And, and it was a really important, like, I think, step for me as an aspiring winemaker to attempt this at home because, um, as I am learning, winemakers are confronted with about a million decisions. And having, having to go through that process and learn from my mistakes has been really, really pivotal. Um, one of the things that happened is that the, the kit that I ordered online came with a six gallon fermenter and then a three gallon carboy for aging the, the wine. 
Mm. So I was already confronted with my first problem, like logistical problem. And what I decided to do was uh, put half the rosé into a carboy and then put the other half into, right, like directly into bottles before it was done fermenting to make a pet knot. <laughs> Which surprised nice. me with no with almost no lab equipment like that worked. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. I remember seeing that uh, you promoted on Facebook and whatnot, and you had some like really cute and fun label printing. Oh yeah, out I was like Instagramming the hell out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I would too um, if I made a pet now. We've always Kendra and I have always dreamed of making our own pet. I know. Now. It's it's actually pretty easy. You just have to like. If you think about the basic equation of winemaking is grape sugar plus yeast equals alcohol and CO2. Mm -hmm. So if you put um, a bunch of fermenting juice into a bottle and close it, it will eventually explode because yeah. of the pressure. The, the key is like to figuring out what level of sugar is left in your fermenting juice to put into the bottle so that that doesn't. Mm, was that, were you like measuring, I don't know if it's the same thing when you're measuring juice, but measuring like bricks levels. Yeah. And then did you have some like failed attempts and explosions and whatnot? No, I mean, I, I was, it was pretty successful. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like the best, <laughs> the best <laughs> representation of pet knot in the world, but. Um, you made it. I, I was pleased that, you know, I have one bottle left and I'm just going to see like how long wait a few years and open it up and see if there's still I'm sure that there's still CO2 inside yeah um but I will say that I um in so in October I was like oh well now it's harvest time in the northern hemisphere you can only really get fresh grapes to make good wine um you know between late August and uh, early November, depending on where you are. And so, as you both know, I'm sure like drinking better and better quality wine, the, the quality of the wine like is completely dependent on the quality of your grapes. And so totally. I can tell you that grape juice concentrate is not gonna make good wine. So I was pretty yeah. excited to try again. Like when, when grapes were available, I drove out to Eastern Washington to the Yakima Valley, ordered um, 200 pounds of Tempranillo, got there, was offered another 100 pounds of Malbec and was like, okay. <laughs> and oh then, boy. and keep in mind, that's like a three and a half hour drive out there and then back. And then, you know, you have to process your grapes pretty soon. So it was a long night of like- You, you do, huh? my... others start like rotting right there on the- No, but you know, the fresher the grapes are when you process them, the better your wine's gonna be. Gotcha. So I, you know, we, we did a pretty good sanitation protocol on our feet, but we did foot stomping just for, just for fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, they've been doing that for hundreds and thousands of years, yeah. so why not? <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and then, so I made some Tempranillo, which I've since, I made a Tempranillo Rosé, a Tempranillo red wine, and then I have the Malbec still brewing in a, in a barrel. Oh, I cool. Yeah. It's amazing. That's a, yeah. you see your little home project from grape muss to grabbing your own fresh grapes is, that's pretty legit. And it's, it's super fun. And I will say that like, since this is a natural wine podcast, I tried to do as little intervention as possible. My Tempranillo has zero SO2 add to it and it tastes fantastic. Mm. Um, I did have to add a little bit of tartaric acid just because it was late October when I picked up the grapes and I think they had gotten a little- um, Very ripe and- they were, they were watery, I think. They had just been irrigated or something and needed, needed to be, uh, I don't know. I don't, shout, I don't as a shout out, shout out to dry farm grapes. Yeah, which is not the case in Washington. Washington mm -hmm. is one of the only regions in the world where grapes are re are irrigated regularly. Hmm. Yeah. Super interesting. But, 
But otherwise, as far as like the SO2 additions, as a winemaker, this might, okay, the, let's cover this topic real quick. So added sulfur, sulfites, I mean, that's always printed on the label because as we discussed before, there's always, it, it's a natural byproduct of just making wine. It just, w w whether you add it or not, it's always going to be in there. And a yeah, lot of yeast, covered in yeast make SO2. And so you're always going to have it in your wine. What it's I wish like a natural preservative it's making for itself. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. Exactly. But and um, SO2 is a really, um, a really beneficial uh, problem solver for winemaking because it prevents oxidation. It is an antimicrobial. It um, can refresh in stale wine. Like it has a lot of uses that when used sparingly can do little damage. Um, so personally, and I'm like a fierce advocate of this, I wish that it was law instead of saying contain sulfites to put the total level of SO2 on the- Totally. I mean, that would be the total, what is it, parts per million or no? Um, it could be, part, I would be happy with parts per million or, um, I mean- Mg per hour or something? Uh, oh. Grams per milliliter. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, how hard is it, I, if there's it's one that thing hard. that we lobby for. It doesn't for... cost much. What I, what I think is that, you know, the vast majority of, my theory is that the vast majority of wines out there are these mass. Um, totally. Mass produced commercial supermarket brands that yeah. if, if you, they were required to put the sulfite <laughs> People would be freaked out. Just People like, would be I mean, freaked out. I feel like I say this all the time. I don't know if I've said this on the pod, but like just how like everything else on the back of a nutrition label has a daily percentage sign except sugar. Like it just says, you know, Coca-Cola, 40 grams of sugar. But it doesn't, if it were to say like daily recommend, it would probably be like 200%. And that would scare people, but it's lobbying for those kind of things. And if I die and we don't have transparency by the time I die on our wine labels, like an ingredients list and like exact sulfite amounts, then I'm going to die unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool to see like more and more in the, in the natural wine world, like people just renegade style listing their, their stuff mm -hmm. the back. It's kind of cool. So I feel like a lot of winemakers are just like, screw it. I'm just going to do this my own way. <laughs> Let everybody know how I'm doing it. What's in there. Yeah, I've been noticing more and more that winemakers are are adding like the acid, like the, your pH content and your total acidity on the label, which is Rips super geeky. The... Like nobody, yeah. nobody who's not a winemaker would care about that. But... I do. I don't make yeah, wine. We I, care. I <laughs> right. Well, but I mean, normal laymans who are just buying like your um, yeah. yellowtail at the gas station. Aren't true, true. 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 Um, well, if you're buying yellowtail, then yeah, it's a different. Thing One thing I was going to say about <laughs> SO2 <laughs> that, oh, what's that, Kendra? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just, I was just joking about yellowtail. All good. <laughs> One thing I was going to say about SO2 is that, um, you know, winemakers do what are called bench trials. And so uh, you line up different samples of wine in your little wine lab. Winemakers have labs, it's really fun. Um, and you can figure out the precise um, percentage of SOT, SO2 that is the perfect amount that will solve your problem or will mm. potentially preserve your wine for a while in the bottle and you not have to worry about it. No winemaker wants to sell, you know, you're making a commercial product and you've worked really hard at it, you don't want it to spoil. You know, in the yeah, so, and that's that's the damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing of like making a low intervention style wine where you add minimal or no SO2 versus adding a whole bunch. And it's really tough. Like I've had some wonderfully long aged, well aged natural wines with minimal SO2 additions. And it's like, it's a lot harder to make those and to have those stand up years and years and years without getting contaminated. So it's like even more so of an art or a craft to be able to do so. Right? Yeah, and that um, is a good segue to another topic, which is how important sanitation is in a winery, especially if you're making low intervention wine. Mm -hmm. um, I am learning very quickly that 90% of what 
people do in a winery is clean things. Huh. And yeah. Okay. That's what Kendra <laughs> does at her household with her husband. Too. Yeah. Oh, okay. My OCD household. <laughs> but it's it's pretty uh, essential. I was at school. I was in class um, in our in our winery, and you know I was instructed to go um, take a sample of uh, Muller Turgau from a drum. And I was using a wine thief, and I had forgotten our sanitation protocol to spray down. You know, it, anything that touches the wine must be sanitized. Mm -hmm. And the way that we do it at our schools, we just spray seventy percent ethanol onto whatever object, um, which is pretty good because that's the alcohol in your wine anyway. Yeah. And so if a little bit gets in, it's not going to. Yeah, it's not going to impact the flavor of the wine. Um, but yeah, like it was just about to like dip the wine thief in without spraying it. And my instructor ran over and was like, no, <laughs> um, but it's a good, re it's a good reminder that like, um, how careful you need to be. Um, and at home, one of the cool things I started doing this like three step sanitation protocol for my home wine making. And then I was talking about it with my with my instructor and he was like just boil water and pour boil water on your um all your winemaking equipment, equipment. I was like, oh yeah that's so much easier and works you know and the scale that i was working at you know just using my little electric kettle and filling it with the boiling, boiling water and then making sure all the surfaces um yeah touch the boiling water but it's important. Otherwise, when you're making it in low intervention, things could spoil. You could introduce unwanted bacteria, which would may lead to faults. And it's not super shelf stable unless you add a bunch of preservatives to it or to, to kind of knock it out. But then you lose some of the, the heart and soul. That's why we love natural wine so much is for the Yeah, and the other and thing too, um, you guys did a whole episode about how you identify a natural wine in the store, mm -hmm. I think. That was a great mm -hmm. episode. Oh, thank you. One thing, yeah, one thing um, I would add is to look for the words unfiltered and unfined, um, mm. because that is a really good um, signifier for Definitely. a low intervention wine. And, and it's cool that at my school, I love my school because um, the production teacher does a good job of like giving you all the options of course, natural winemaking is a big trend right now. And, um, you know, there's not, there's a million decisions that a winemaker has to make along, along the way. And a different winemaker, given the same grapes and using the same equipment, could make different wines, essentially. It's truly a choose your own adventure. Truly a choose your own adventure <laughs> thing. But like two of the processes that winemakers can choose to do is fining and filtering. And one easy way of thinking about those two processes is that fining is you're adding something to the wine and filtering, you're taking something out of it. Mm. Um, and both of those things could, I mean, they're tried and true methodologies that are really fascinating to learn about, but they're also kind of horrifying to learn about. Um, and I'm so grateful that I'm learning about them because if I'm going to be a true rebel natural winemaker, you got to learn what you're um, rebelling against, right? Yeah. So we're the rebels. We're the um, we're the resistance, huh? <laughs> right. So, so um, it's it was really cool. Uh, last quarter we did a finding trial where uh, my teacher like took a bunch of samples of the Merlot, let's say, and he added. This is what it tastes like without anything. This is what it tastes like with uh, egg whites. This is what okay. it tastes like with gelatin. This is what it tastes like with bentonite. This is what it tastes like with um, Isinglass, which is like a fish bladder. Yeah. Yeah, Isinglass. That um, one's weird. Yeah, but you know what? It it like it will smell fishy when you add it, but it has no impact on the wine for some reason. If you use that, real quick segue, if you use Isinglass to fine, can you put the vegan symbol on your wine or not? I wouldn't. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, think you can. Okay. I will also tell you that 
I have, I, I did some volunteering at some, some winemaker, uh, some wineries, excuse me, and <laughs> during harvest last year, and I was shoveling like tons and tons of Syrah into a destemmer, and I could not believe how many spiders were in. <laughs> So many spiders. Definitely. Oh my like, gosh. I mean, that's vegan either. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's unrealistic for everybody to think of wine as just this beautiful product. We see it on TV, we see the marketing. There is a, if you're not hand picking, or even if you are hand picking, you're still going to get some spiders. Ants or something. It, it bugs. <laughs> so that's real talk right there. That's yeah. Awesome. So um, getting back to the finding, there is all these additives that you can add. Um, and if you think about wine in a really unsexy way, a wine is just like a soup of all these components like acid and alcohol and sugar. And then you've got your phenolics, which are these um, more complex compounds that give it flavor and, and aroma. And then you've got tannins, um, but you also have proteins. Mm. And one of the things that um, we like as natural wine drinkers sometimes is like a pretty like turbid, cloudy wine. Mm -hmm. we don't like that. But the vast majority of consumers don't like that. And yeah. so the way that you get you uh, remove cloudiness is usually um, through filtration. Right. And or that fining, you remove some cloudiness. Is it? Is you that can wrong? do that with fining too. Um, yeah, there. Yeah, betonite is usually like, which is betonite is kind of like a clay. That okay. Uh, yeah, I've put it on my face before. A betonite clay face. mask. Yeah. You can use it to waterproof your basement. Uh -huh. um, but you can also use it. Um, I think that it's like a negatively charged, like. I think betonite is really helpful because it's both positively and negatively charged. And so different particles will stick to, to the betonite and then you just leave it in your tank and then it will all settle to the bottom and you can rack your wine off of it and no mm. betonite will be in the wine. Yeah. And like racking it off basically means that you're yeah. just pumping the top part so off and kind of leaving it. Usually the you don't even have to filter wine if you use betonite. But there are, um, there are additives that you can add as finding agents that are like um, synthetic um, polymers that apparently they sound really gross to me and I like once learning that like after learning that like winemakers use that I was like oh that's so gross but it, they have to filter like it's required that you filter after using that. After you use that okay and no, so after tell you us use like a, a synthetic poly like a synthetic okay yeah. gotcha gotcha so tell us about I don't know, firsthand tasting of the different, no finding versus all the different ones. And then maybe why you s kind of believe or do believe in not finding or filtering most of the time. I, it was, it was really interesting. We probably tasted six, six or seven wines that day, um, each with, with four or five different finding agents. And of course we had our control with none at all. I would like to say, I would, I would say that most of them, I was like, this one in the end with the, the control is the one that tastes the best to me. Um, Interesting. But I will say that things like egg whites didn't bother me that much. Okay. Um, I That's good didn't to know. love the taste of gelatin. Uh, there was probably a lot of betonite bet -nice lees in the samples that we were tasting. So, um, yeah. Me, the mouthfeel was maybe a little yeah pleasant. Do but. you do you find that it and maybe this is the the mat I like to believe in magic and in Kendra's uh, a part time witch on the side um, and so <laughs> don't tell anybody I know I'm not supposed to tell anybody that that's but, why she um, likes the biodynamic juice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there, do you, I kind of just have this nice ideal in my head that you lose a little bit of what's alive in the wine or a little bit of the terroir if you find and filter it. And is there a little bit of truth to that or is this this nice fairy tale that I have in my head? 
Um, anything goes, really. I think that's true to some extent. Um, you're definitely, like I said, if you're adding and taking things away, then you are changing the nature of the wine. Mm -hmm. um, filtering, we didn't really talk about that, but real quick, a way to think about filtering is that if you, like there's different levels of filtering. And if you are in a rainstorm, and the rain is the wine in this case, and you're under a tree, and you know, like that's that's your protection from the rain. You'll get, you'll still get a little wet, right? Yeah. But if you're out of the rain and you've got an umbrella, then you know, you'll still get like some splash, some splashes, but you'll get like mostly protected. And then, you know, the best sort of situation is that if you're standing with your umbrella under the tree, that will prevent the most water from getting out. And so there are various, um, if you think about our unsexy wine soup again, with all these particles. It's, after this interview conversation, I don't know if I can ever talk about wine soup again. But I know. It's a good I, analogy. It's really fascinating to think about, like, you know, sometimes, um, in an earlier version of my life, for instance, I was a music major and learning music theory completely ruined music for me. Like I was constantly totally. analyzing it. And I constantly do that for wine now, but I really enjoy um, solving the mystery and figuring out how wine was made, learning, um, I don't know, what flavor compound, mm -hmm. I don't know. D dissecting wine is, is, is part of the joy at this point. Okay. Well, I have a question. Um, so if you, um, for any like, you know, people who are interested in learning more about winemaking or have already started on the journey, were there any like books or materials that you found super helpful as you were kind of like delving into all this? Yeah, um, I would say if you're serious about learning how to winemake, um, depending on where you are, there's a lot of places that have schools and programs like mine. Um, and of course, there are the like fancier schools like UC Davis and um, mm -hmm. Washington have the program at Washington State University. Um, but let's see, I pulled some books actually. I think you were going to ask this, Kendra. Nice. Um, oh, I the love Wine Folly book love is it. phenomenal. I wouldn't say that it like goes into anything deep about winemaking but just really understanding the wines of the world. It is a terrific resource. Um, and of course, um, it's called Madeline Wine Phuket, Folly. Wine Folly. Winefolly.com to uh, Madeline Phuket does a great blog. And, um, and even their Instagram for little even their Instagram is fantastic. Yeah, true. She's a Seattle girl. <laughs> mm. um, one of my favorite textbooks from school is this one called Understanding Wine Technology. Right. Um, the Science of Wine Explained by David Bird. Really, really awesome book that kind of... David Bird, not Little Dicky, I'm assuming. <laughs> it goes into the weeds quite a bit with some things, but as a general overview too, you know, it, it will explain what different enzymes do in the wine or different um, binding agents or different filtering. But it's, it's pretty good and it's very readable. And it's got good illustrations. Super cool. Um, yeah. Nice. Thank That's, you. Um, we have like four-ish minutes left. Let's, I'm, oh, really quick. I'm gonna run over what I'm drinking tonight just for oh, yeah. the visual. What are you guys drinking? Visual people. This is an Italian red um, by this producer called Matita. Mm. And it's there. I think it's kind of like their base level. It's just called Rosso. So red wine. It's delicious. It's imported by one of my favorite uh, importers, Critical Mass Selections. I generally like most of their stuff that they bring in. Yeah, they're fantastic. It's definitely a little bit baby's diaper poo-poo on the nose when you first open it, which... To some, it might be a turnoff, but boy, I have no kids. Maybe I'm ready for kids. I'm ready to change some diapers. I love it. Oh my God. That drifts away, and it's like a little metallic-y then, and then super cloudy, and then just like juicy 
juicy red fruits. It's it's actually honestly really delicious. I'll definitely buy it again. I've actually had it a few times. But anyway, Ben, what what are you sipping on? I want to hear what Kendra's drinking first. Um, I am sipping on a a Gamay, a natural. Ooh. Uh, one of my favorite little West Side, West Side stores here got it in Lincoln Fine Wines. Um, they were on mm. the pod a while ago. Is it Beaujolais or from? New no, World? um, it's from New York, actually. New well, York? No. I didn't. Bring, I I just poured it real quick right before I ran over here, so I don't have the bottle. The Gam- I think it's um, is that the one that we had in Telluride together? Mm, I believe it's called Guest Bard. Yeah, it might be Loire, Loire Valley or something, I think. That I, don't think I don't think it's from Beaujolais. No, it's, it's definitely not. But um, it's delicious. It's Somewhere in France. Yeah, it's just very, like, poppy and fun. And... I love Loire wines. They're, like, they're my favorite. Yeah, that's, um, uh, it's a good, I feel like we have to find the new Beaujolais. And it, it might be Loire, honestly, because yeah. uh, the new best bang for your buck before that producers blow up in that region and then it becomes, you know, unaffordable again. What about you, Benjamin? Well, well I just got back from a trip to the Willamette Valley down in Oregon. And I am a huge fan of Oregon wines. I think that Oregon is doing a real like knock, they're knocking it out of the park in terms of low intervention, natural and biodynamic wines, winemaking. Um, the wine I brought to share what is a Blaufrankisch from mm. a winery called Craft Wine Company, which has three labels. Um, and this, they have like three brands, I meant to say. And this is from their Minimus brand. Um, show, from, show us the label up close a little bit, if you can. This is like, can you see, it's like a story. Okay, okay. So, cool. Yeah. Beautiful. But it's from, I, I wanted to share this wine with you guys to highlight Johan Vineyard, which is one of the preeminent biodynamic vineyards down in Oregon. Hmm. And so many, so many great wines I've had have been from that vineyard, and I finally got to go. Um, and it's just the most spectacular place um, in the Van Duzer corridor, which is just outside of Salem. And I know that we're running out of time, but yeah, this is a lovely wine. Um, awesome. Well, I just what, want to be sure, the... as we're, count, we're counting down here on, on some seconds. Oh yeah, we need to give you some quick shout outs. Yeah, ben, we want to give you some shout outs. Um, I know you're, you're on you got the 30. Uh, at bennylynn.childmodel. <laughs> Love it. Amazing. How else can we support you? We may get caught yeah, up, follow, but go for it. Follow me on Insta. I, if I um, decide to open a winery or something, I will certainly announce my plans there. I love it. Perfect. Well, we so appreciate you Cheers. time to chat with us. This is awesome. So fun. Let's do it again. Cheers. Let's do it again, and we can talk about Washington, Oregon wines. I would love that, and your wines in the future. Yes. I'll send you guys, I should send you guys a bottle.